All right, everybody. Welcome uh, to the most recent iteration of my weather and climate office hours. Hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties to start off this one, uh, but just let me know in case there are. As always, the setup changes from week to week, so it's always a little bit hard to know what setting changes uh, have messed things up uh, in some way or another. Uh, but assuming we're good to go, uh, and I'll, I'll make that assumption unless somebody tells me otherwise in the chat, uh, today I really wanted to talk, um, you guessed it, about El Nino again and what it means for California winter conditions and also sort of philosophically how we interpret uh, predictive failures, or at least the appearance of forecast failures, and how we distinguish uh, a good probabilistic forecast from one that was not so good. It's not nearly as easy uh, as, uh, or nearly not so simple as looking at whether, for example, uh, a forecast for rain tomorrow actually materializes or not. There's a lot more that goes into it on longer timescales and across longer, wider regions, because it's really not the same question. We're asking, as I've mentioned before, probabilistic questions at seasonal and sub-seasonal scales, rather than primarily deterministic questions on much shorter weather prediction timescales. But anyway, I'll get into all of this. I do want today's focus to be uh, on El Nino, and I think uh, the, the, the real challenge is uh, having a conversation about El Nino in terms of California climate because the narrative has shifted dramatically uh, over time. And a lot of folks like to post a, a meme, uh, an SNL meme uh, from uh, the 80s. And really what that comes from is the, uh, it's, it's a Chris Farley uh, segment, I believe, that it's clipped from. Where this comes from is essentially the fact that the big El Nino event in 1982-1983, that winter, was an exceptionally wet winter for California with some significant flood and water-related impacts. And the, the popular uh, mythology surrounding El Nino as this uh, generator of moisture and water and big storms and big rains in California sort of took off from that point. Um, I, I, I wasn't around in the, in the scientific community at that time to know exactly what triggered the, the, the surge in research that then followed. But there was, in fact, uh, a lot of research from the 80s into the 90s on El Nino. And a lot of these folks were very uh, atmospheric dynamics heavy researchers. So there is actually a lot of fundamental physics theory, atmospheric dynamics theory, embedded in in what we in what we now call El Nino Southern Oscillation, referring to both El Nino and La Nina, its cooler counterpart. This actually came initially out of pretty basic atmospheric theory, uh, ENSO being a nonlinear coupled feedback process between the tropical Pacific Ocean and the atmosphere, which has global effects. This was something that We've certainly observed for as long as we've been observing the ocean and the atmosphere. In fact, uh, fisher, fishermen off the coast of Peru observed this long before there, there was a formal theory for why there was this episodic warming uh, of the near shore waters off the west coast of South America. So this is not something that is a new phenomena uh, per se, but it is something that is uh, been progressively better understood and there was a sea change in the physical understanding surrounding ENSO in the 1980s and 1990s. And then in pop culture, that early 80s El Nino event, which did turn out to be an exceptionally wet event for California that a lot of people who were alive at that point remember, same thing then happened with the late 90s. Very strong El Nino event, 97, 98, also an exceptionally wet year in California with, again, major flood-related impacts in some places. And so really what happened was El Ni even though there were uh, other El Nino events in the intervening years that were not as strong and not as wet, uh, this sort of entered the California weather and climate mythology as this, this magical predictor of wet conditions. And the interesting thing is the science never said that, although it did say something about what uh, these uh, transitory and semi-periodic warming of the eastern tropical Pacific Ocean meant for California. Uh, 
But what's more interesting is what's happened in more recent years. So in 2015, 2016, the, the most recent strong or very strong El Nino event uh, is since uh, be- prior to the, the one that's now ongoing at present, that event was uh, not an exceptionally wet year in California. Notably, not a, a dry year either. It was actually somewhat closer to average or a little bit above average in some spots. It was a really uh, remarkably unremarkable year in some ways, despite how dramatic El Nino was in the tropical Pacific Ocean, how wet conditions actually were at that point. Uh, or excuse me, how warm things were at that point in the tropical Pacific. So then the narrative shifted. Uh, you know, I remember being in Westwood near UCLA campus in, in 2015, late 2015, and there were ads on buses, on the sides of buses from water management districts and stormwater management districts reminding people to clear out their gutters and make sure the storm drains didn't get clogged during the El Nino storms to come. That's how deeply rooted it was in, I think, the California, and especially the Southern California, sort of weather and climate lore. I even have a photo of one of those signs because in retrospect, it's it's kind of remarkable that that winter was not a big winter in California. But then the public uh, public opinion and public perception swung pretty dramatically in the opposite direction. And then they're all and because of course 2015 2016 was the year that didn't break California's extreme drought. There were folks saying, "Oh no, well climate change has come and messed up the connection between El Nino and California rainfall. We can't rely on it anymore. What are we going to do? Everything is different. You know, all the reliable priors aren't 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 really so reliable anymore." And at that time, I pushed back against it. I said, you know, this year clearly was not as wet as as the median predictions had predicted. And so that was, I think, fair to call a predictive failure. Although, as always, with probabilistic forecasts and talking about tilts and the odds, it's awfully difficult to evaluate that with a sample size of one. But that said, the expectation was that 2015-16 winter would be potentially significantly wetter than usual, and it was not in California. I don't necessarily think that tells us anything about the relationship between El Nino or strong El Nino events and California wintertime precipitation in the long run. I don't think it tells us that the relationship between El Nino and precipitation is broken or has changed dramatically in a warming world or gone away. In fact, there's a lot of research suggesting that the teleconnections, the remote influences of El Nino on California precipitation should probably strengthen, if anything, in a warming climate. That's not a lot of certainty behind that, but there's certainly no indication that they will weaken. In fact, there are some suggestions in the published literature that the predictability of seasonal precipitation in California might actually increase in a warmer climate because El Nino and La Nina cycling becomes an increasingly prominent piece of the picture. In addition to uh, amplifying Madden Julian oscillation, the MJO, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So in 2015, 2016, I said quite publicly that if we had another really strong East-based El Nino event, I would again, even after the 15, 16 predictive failure, so to speak, uh, say that there was a strong tilt in the odds towards wider than average conditions during California winter, especially in Central and Southern California. It does get fuzzier up in Northern California, that much is certainly true. And here we are again uh, this year with a very strong El Nino event once again. We've now gone from strong to maybe even stronger than strong, so very strong up in the upper echelons of what we've observed historically over the past century or so, with Nino 3.4 temperatures eclipsing uh, plus 2 degrees centigrade, or about 3 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit above average. Those are big anomalies for the tropical oceans, that's for sure. Uh, Just want to... Pause for a moment, make sure that everything is as it should be. Yes, apologies for that, just wanted to make sure there wasn't a glitch, but it looks like we're, we're still clear. Um, so I think uh, Where we are now is with this very strong El Nino event once again, and you know, I'm making the similar prediction that I've made before, which is that this year is is likely to be wetter than average this winter, especially in Central and Southern California, that there is a notable, significant tilt in the odds uh, 
toward wetter than average conditions uh, really for the rest of the season. Now, that may be in great contrast to what we're seeing in California right now in this moment where a lot of the state is going through a bit of a dry spell. As it turns out, the autumn will, will end up, uh, as we wrap up the month of November, drier than average uh, in most cases in California. What's interesting is that autumn precipitation in California does not really have very much at all to do with El Nino or, or La Nina conditions necessarily. The, the autumn does something usually very different uh, from the winter. And because meteorological seasons are a bit lagged from astronomical seasons, the first half of December for, for uh, meteorological purposes is essentially the autumn uh, because the base state of the atmosphere, the position of the jet stream, all of that kind of stuff is more in a fall-like configuration at this time of year than it is a winter-like configuration. And so because of that, even as we look forward into the next couple of weeks, what we're really looking at is the tail end of meteorological fall. Uh, and I know that some folks quibble about the definition of that, but I'm talking about it from a North Pacific atmospheric dynamics and atmospheric circulation perspective. We're effectively still uh, in, in the autumn. And so what's happening right now, I'm not sure has a great deal of bearing on what's going to happen later this winter when we see more of a winter-like base state uh, as, we, as we go forward in time. And so right now, what we've seen is those of you who read my most recent blog post uh, will probably be disappointed uh, that it isn't raining right now, despite what that blog post had suggested would probably happen as we head toward early December. Granted, it has rained some. The parts of the Bay Area got a nice soaking yesterday, and it's, it is snowing lightly in the Sierra today, so it's definitely not completely dry. And there may be some additional opportunities for light precipitation, but in general, it does look like the first couple of weeks of December will probably be drier on average, uh, especially in Southern California, which is of course not the usual El Nino pattern in winter. But again, I'm emphasizing that we're not really in winter yet from a meteorological perspective. So please do keep that in mind as well. The interesting thing about the sort of predictive failures, if you will, that we've seen this, this fall is mainly that this has been characterized by a very high amplitude wave pattern in the atmosphere, a very wavy jet stream with very strong ridges and, and low pressure systems that are somewhat cut off from the jet stream. So the last time something didn't go quite as planned toward the beginning of, of the month in November, there was a really big but fairly unstable cutoff low near the coast of California. And that did produce uh, some pretty in, in impressive thunderstorms in some places. So there was actually quite respectable precipitation from that storm in the end in some spots, but it really passed over some other places entirely. This more recent predictive failure, the storms really just aren't making it toward California at all, but instead are ending up uh, aiming themselves toward the Pacific Northwest. So if you look north this week, there actually is going to be a major storm sequence up in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia characterized by multiple moderate to strong or even locally extreme a Pineapple Express style atmospheric river storms that's going to deliver a huge amount of water to that part of the country. Uh, keep in mind that in the Pacific Northwest, the autumn in many places is the wettest time of year, not the winter. And that is different from California, where the peak of the rainy season really doesn't begin in most places toward late December or going through March. And in some years, and in particular, during strong El Nino years, that season is often backweighted. So that's one of the, 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 the challenges in communicating this, is we've seen this really kind of wonky uh, jet stream pattern this fall. Uh, there, granted, the jet stream in the fall is usually wavier and, if you will, wonkier than it is in winter because, again, the base state is different. The temperature differential, that thermal wind, as it's called, uh, in the atmosphere that drives the jet stream via the meridional temperature contrast is not as strong in the fall as it is in winter because the fall is essentially isn't as cold as the winter and the equator is as, about as warm as it is pretty much the whole year round. There isn't a lot of temperature variability there. So the greatest contrast between the equator and the poles is right in the middle of winter because in the middle of winter is when it's coldest in the Arctic or in the Antarctic and that tends to be when the jet stream is strongest, most coherent, and most west to east oriented.
So we're not there yet, and this tends to happen in the transition seasons in autumn and spring in both hemispheres. Patterns are more difficult to predict. The jet stream is wavier because it's weaker, and the winter base state hasn't set up yet. That's where we are right now. And so looking forward, there continue to be signs that the Pacific jet is going to try to strengthen, uh, become more zonally or west to east oriented, and extend closer and closer to California as we progress through the month of December. This might paradoxically help pump up a ridge over California in the short term, over the next 10 to, 10 to 12 days or so. Some of that has to do with the diabetic heating, not the diabetic heating, but the diabetic heating from precipitation occurring upstream, so to the west and northwest of California, that actually uh, causes a release of latent heat in the atmosphere, and that can sometimes pump up a ridge even farther downstream. So sometimes, the stronger the jet, the more impressive the jet in the west and central Pacific, the more impressive the ridging is over California. But as we head closer to that winter base state later in the month, it's really likely that that jet stream will nudge closer and closer to California. And it's honestly difficult to say exactly when it's going to get here. It's not going to be in the next 10 or 12 days, but it might happen as soon as mid-December, or it might take really most of the month. It might take until the end of the month, uh, right around New Year's for this to really get going. But I really do think that's what's probably what's going to happen for two reasons. One, uh, we move out of this unfavorable wavy jet stream pattern, uh, partly because the winter base state starts to take over, as we've been talking about. Just as a climatological average, by the time we get towards late December, the jet is more coherent, more west to east focused. And that means that the existence of a very strong, again, it is very strong, east-based El Nino in the Pacific makes it easier for that jet stream to extend all the way to California than it would normally be. And so that is when, from late December through about March, is when I would expect that the odds will be tilted greatly favoring what are the average conditions, at least in Central and Southern California, and maybe Northern California as well. Uh, this is not, you know, it's a little bit wishy-washier in Northern California, but I still think that based on the seasonal predictions that I'm seeing, there's a reasonable chance that this will actually extend throughout the state of California, but it might take a while to get going. It might really wait until January. Whew. A lot to talk about. A lot of complexity in there. And so hopefully that generates some specific questions that I can answer down the line. Since I see there aren't too many, there's a couple in the queue right now, but please do ask them. Um, I think one thing that is, is frustrating for folks is that uh, when you look at the weather predictions, you look at the weather models, and I know there's a lot of people who follow this channel on the Weather West blog who are actually looking at weather data themselves, the GFS model or the European model, not all of you, of course, but uh, probably a greater than uh, random sampling of the population, I would argue, uh, people who watch this uh, are actively looking at weather model output. Uh, keep in mind two things. One is that the farther out you go, really once you get out much beyond a week, your, your ability to discern specific weather features degrades very rapidly. And you really, once you get out beyond five or seven days, there's not much point in looking at the individual deterministic runs of individual weather models. What you really need to be do is, do, doing is looking at the distribution of possible outcomes across the broad ensemble, both the ensemble of individual models, so each model is run four times a day and usually has dozens of members each, and also the differences between the multi-model ensembles. So there are multiple models, the American model, the Canadian model, the European model, that are each run four times a day, but dozens of iterations each. There are literally hundreds of individual two to three week forecast predictions made every single day in the world. And that's just using those made by the three major global modeling centers. So it's a lot to digest, it's a lot to interpret, there's a lot to contextualize in that. And so it can get difficult sometimes to, to sort of cut through the noise. And my only advice for those who are going to uh, model ride, as it's called in the Weather West blog comment section, a hat tip to the regulars there, is to use the ensembles. It's the most responsible way to model ride if you're going to do it. Because if you're looking at these individual model members going out two weeks in the future, 
you're pretty much just looking at one of hundreds of plausible potential futures that are likely quite divergent from each other. This is a direct effect of the butterfly effect. This is literally the butterfly effect in action. And, you know, what? it may not be a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil causing a tornado in Texas, which was the original framing of, of, of that saying, but that is quite literally true. Once you get out to a long enough time scale, these infinitesimally small perturbations to the system make it impossible, even theoretically. There's a theoretical limit on how specifically we can predict conditions at points more than a week or so out in the future. So that doesn't mean that we can't say anything about the future. It just means that we have to move from trying to predict the exact conditions to predicting the probability range of conditions in the future. So the probabilistic forecasts I keep harping on rather than the deterministic ones, which is like asking what will happen at 3 p.m. in San Francisco on December 5th. A specific type of prediction versus saying, what is the tilt and the odds in January towards wetter or drier than average conditions in Central California? The former, a deterministic question, the latter, a probabilistic one. So I'm gonna take a break uh, to take a sip of green tea so I don't lose my voice by the end of this conversation. Uh, you may see uh, you may see an ad or something pop up in the meantime, but I am still here. I'm just trying to conserve my voice, take a sip of tea. So give me a minute here. All right, thanks everybody, I'm a little refreshed. One thing I wanted to draw your attention to just before I get back into El Nino is I put a couple of links in the chat uh, right up at the top if you scroll up. The first link, I just wanted to let folks know that because many people have asked for something like this, there's now an ad-free membership version of weatherwest.com. Uh, I'm going to be a really bad salesperson. You don't get anything uh, for your $3.99 a month except for the ability to not see ads anymore. Uh, so it's mainly a means of supporting the website. There's no additional content and never fear. If you don't sign up, you'll still be able to read everything exactly as you have before. You'll just continue to see the existing ads. So thank you for those who have supported. The link is up there if you're interested. Uh, if you're not interested, just completely ignore it and your experience probably won't change. Uh, the other link uh, that I, I've put, which is link number two above, is a link to a blog post uh, from uh, the uh, NOAA's uh, Climate Prediction Center folks, which I think is really excellent and actually speaks directly to these kinds of questions I'm talking about right now, about El Nino and teleconnections and precipitation and probabilistic forecasting and ensemble modeling. All of that in a pretty concise way and digestible way. It's a great resource in general, but this particular blog post that I've linked to out this week, I think is, uh, they're almost reading my mind. Uh, so I would encourage, strongly encourage folks to check that out. I think it's really good uh, and explains a lot of the common questions um, that, that folks have been asking recently. All right, so where are we now? Generally speaking, I don't know exactly when it's going to rain again significantly. There'll be some on and off snow showers in the mountains and some brief showers elsewhere over the next couple of weeks in parts of California, but no big storms. The Pacific Northwest does look like it's really going to get reamed, uh, as it were, uh, with some, some pretty intense atmospheric rivers. Um, fortunately, uh, it hasn't been a very wet fall in most spots. In fact, it's been a dry one, so... I don't think there's going to be widespread severe flooding, but there could be some flooding up there uh, as some significant precipitation really starts to accumulate. These will be relatively warm storms as well, which uh, the Cascades are not generally very tall mountain ranges. So that does mean that a lot of the water is going to fall as rain rather than snow, which always increases runoff. I do think that the California pattern will shift sometime in December, but it might take another couple weeks so uh, I wouldn't get too worried at this point. I still think that there's likely to be a rather dramatic shift at some point between mid-December and early January as out the, the, base, the seasonal base state shifts, as uh, El Nino 
essentially uh, becomes an even more dominant influence, partly because it's hanging on and partly because that base state shift allows it to have a greater effect. And also because of something else I mentioned, the Madden-Julian oscillation, the MJO, uh, that has been sort of in a messy state right now. It, it's, it's a, it's a, I've mentioned it before, I won't go into the details too much, but it's a coupled uh, oscillation be, that, that essentially, uh, it, it's, it's a tropical atmospheric uh, wave pattern, a mode of natural variability, an irregular mode, subseasonal mode, meaning that it evolves multiple times per year, every year, it is more active in some years than others, and during strong El Nino events, it can strongly reinforce the effect of El Nino in many cases, at least when it's in the right phase. So in some phases, it destructively interferes with the El Nino influence. We're seeing some of that right now. But in other phases, and these are the phases we'll likely see it cycling through later in the season, it can constructively interfere, meaning it can amplify the effects of El Nino, and that is when we would be most likely to see these intense, very wet storm cycles, potentially souped up by warm oceans generally, and El Nino in particular, as it shifts the jet stream later this winter. So that's sort of what I'm thinking in terms of the timeline and why. The base state is going to become more favorable for El Nino to exert a more powerful influence over the next few weeks heading in toward the end of the year. The Madden Julian oscillation, the MJO, may enter a more favorable configuration, and that might help things along too, but even if it doesn't, I think that base state and El Nino shift uh, will probably uh, result in a pattern change anyway. It's just difficult to pinpoint exactly when that's going to happen at this point. So that's what I'm thinking about uh, in, in the short term, and uh, it's about halfway through the hour, so I actually wanted to take time to answer questions now um, rather than waiting for the end, and then depending on how things go, how many questions there are, I'll be able to tackled some other topics toward the end. So I'm just gonna essentially, as I always do, uh, start at the beginning uh, and start reading here. Oh yes, uh, Art mentions the, uh, the, the Weather West logo uh, for the YouTube channel. If you look closely, there's some Easter eggs. I think that many folks who are used to looking at weather maps might recognize, so feel free to check that out. Uh, Question from Matthew: What, uh, what, what are the physics for? What's the physics for dummies version of why a warming climate would enhance the predictability of ENSO for precipitation? It's a good question. I mentioned that earlier. One of the reasons is that we expect that things like the Madden-Julian oscillation that I just mentioned, this mode of subseasonal variability that itself is independent of ENSO, but either uh, constructively or destructively interferes with ENSO, depending on the background state, uh, that MDO itself is likely to become m amplified, more pronounced. And so the, essentially when we have El Nino events, uh, that the MJO, when it is in a favorable phase, might exert an even stronger influence in reinforcing the respective effects of El Nino on the wet side for California or La Nina on the dry side, because there are different phases of the MJO that interfere constructively or destructively with the opposite phases of ENSO, as you might expect. The other thing is that at least at the moment, we expect that the likelihood of seeing extreme El Nino and La Nina events is increasing in a warming climate. The likelihood of seeing more weak to moderate events is not really clear at this point, but it does seem likely that no matter what happens, we'll probably see more extreme individual El Nino events and La Nina events. This is probably a portion of why California is projected to see such large increases in what we're calling hydroclimate whiplash, by the way, these wide swings between extremely wet and extremely dry conditions. But all of that is, you know, it, it's not set in stone. And there is, there are active conversations right now about how climate models may or may not be getting the response of El Nino and ENSO to global warming correct. We're sort of in the space where the real world has done something somewhat different from what the models said it would be doing at this point. As an earth scientist, that always gives us pause. But as a climate scientist used to thinking about the long game, and again, ensemble modeling, it brings up an interesting conundrum. Uh, 
because the real world, you can think about it as one of many potential iterations of plausible recent climates. Just as each model run is a plausible, in, a plausible individual uh, weather or climate future that we ne can't necessarily at this point distinguish the likelihood of one versus another. So if we think about that in the context of what's happened in the real world, and if that's diverging from models, keep in mind that the models are representing a plume or an ensemble of multiple different uh, presents, essentially. Uh, so the last few decades could have gone some other way than they actually did in the real world. And ideally, a perfect climate model, which of course we don't have, none of them, no models are perfect, but even in an ideal world, if we had a perfect model uh, for the atmosphere on those timescales, you would see that each member still would have a different temporal evolution. And it's not always clear whether the real world just happens to be something akin to an outlier member of the ensemble. Is what we're observing truly a divergence from the ensemble, or is it just representative of one of the outermost, uh, essentially outlying members of the ensemble of what could have been. Uh, when I talk like this, folks joke with me about the existential angst that seems embedded in all of this, but it, it really is an important way of conceptualizing not just climate predictions for the future, but even our understanding of how climate change has evolved in the past. And was what we've observed over the past century the most likely iteration of what could have happened in that climate regime? In some cases, not necessarily. And so some things that we have ascribed to mismatches between predictive models and reality, clearly, you know, it, there, there is some semblance of an objective reality in terms of our measurements, although even there, there is measurement error and uncertainty associated with it. But generally speaking, we have observed what we've observed, but just because what we've observed is different from what climate models suggest for that period doesn't automatically mean that the climate models are wrong. Perhaps we just got unlucky. Perhaps we just saw a weird iteration of what the real world is capable of. And that sort of is a bit of an in the weeds way of thinking about is essentially, is the climate model response to El Nino actually wrong or are we just sort of out there in the tail of the distribution? And the honest answer is we don't know yet. There are scientists who believe that both things might be true. I genuinely think it could be either. I would like to think that the models are capturing the behavior of these things correctly, but it's possible they're not. And that is going to be a very important topic of research, El Nino and so in a warming climate in the years to come, because it is very consequential for places like California. By the way, for California, even if the models are wrong about El Nino and ENSO and global warming, I would still think, I would still expect that our prediction of increasing precipitation and hydroclimate whiplash will hold true. But the, the flavor of it might be different. Right now, these models predict that the increase in the very wet events will be greater than the increase in the very dry events, although both probably will increase. If the models are wrong about El Nino, I'm betting that would swing in the opposite direction, where we would still see an increase in very wet events and very dry events, but it might be more weighted toward an increase in very dry events. And at this point, we just don't know which of those is going to pan out. But I guess the, the silver lining, as it were, whether it's really a silver lining is a gen genuine matter of debate, but the silver lining is that either way, we're probably going to see increased hydroclimate whiplash. But is it dry flavored or wet flavored whip whiplash, if you will? We're currently writing a review paper on hydroclimate whiplash in a warming world. I'll be presenting on that work uh, done with a, a lot of my colleagues uh, from over the years, actually. It's been great to work with all of them on this new project uh, at the American Geophysical Union fall meeting in a couple of weeks in San Francisco. So if you're going to be there, uh, check out our session uh, and my talk within it. Uh, all right, I'm gonna keep looking down at questions. That was a long response, but hopefully folks got something out of it, even if it was a little bit different than what the question was intended to, to ask in the first place. Uh, there's a couple of questions about uh, nor far Northwest California, so the North Coast region. That is one part of the state that probably will see significant rainfall over the next couple of weeks. The northernmost coast of California, say that the, the northernmost 50 or 75 miles of the California coast, is uh, it, 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 you know, often sees quite different conditions than the rest of the state. 
especially this time of year, because it's it, it's really arguably more of a, almost a Pacific Northwest climate influence in that northwesternmost corner of the state. Uh, because storms that affect Oregon and Washington significantly often do still affect the, the northwesternmost coast of California, even if they essentially bypass the rest of the state. So uh, th there will be pretty wet conditions that, that that part, the far northwestern part of California will get the tail end of these atmospheric rivers, and so there could be some significant precipitation from them. Nothing extraordinary or concerning, certainly, but certainly more rain uh, in that two-week outlook for the far north coast than it for anywhere else in the state. So, uh, the, and that's good news because this has actually been a part of the state that has been pretty dry. It's a part of the state that was not super wet last winter. And so I'm glad to see that there's, there's going to be moisture up there. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not a season's worth by any means. So, you know, we'll see what happens next, but that is one corner of the state that we'll be seeing precipitation over the next couple of weeks, even though it's not home to California's major population centers or its largest reservoirs or watersheds. Uh, it is nice to see uh, some more significant precipitation falling up there. A question from Mark. Uh, do enough data exist for historical uh, El Nino rainfall events like, like the late 60s in Southern California, for example, that help identify precursor patterns that might have been contributors? Yeah, back into the 1960s uh, and even in the 1950s, we have good rainfall records from places like California. Uh, really, we have rain, good, pretty good rainfall records in California going back the better part of a century. Um, the question is really, it's not so much rainfall records, but it's actually the atmospheric condition records because it's one thing to get rain and ra rain gauges and thermometers on land. Those have been around now for well over a century in a lot of populated parts of the world. Uh, but what about the oceans and what about the vertical levels of the atmosphere? That was something that prior to the satellite era, which really didn't begin until the late 1970s for the purposes of meteorological monitoring. So that's a relatively uh, recent development in the, in the global context of things. Uh, we don't have as much certainty as to what atmospheric patterns look like. We do have uh, a sort of synthesized data products known as atmospheric reanalyses. Uh, so these are essentially pseudo observational data set. So essentially it's using all the observations we have available to us at a given point in time and stitching them together using effectively process-based weather models. So we're using these weather models to make essentially six hour weather predictions over and over again where they keep getting reinitialized with new observation data. The idea there is they don't drift as much as, you know, if we if you just ran a weather model with initial conditions and then looked at the forecast in seven days, as I was just talking about, that's gonna wiggle around a lot. But if you keep running it for only six hours in the future and you keep giving it your best estimate of what the conditions were at the beginning of that six hour period, you actually get a lot closer to approximating the way the atmosphere really was within the, the, the bounds of the model uncertainty and the observational uncertainty, which can still be significant. But all of this is to say, without getting into the weeds too much, uh, we generally do have that data. We do understand the relationships uh, going between El Nino and California precipitation. And more importantly, we don't have to restrict ourselves to observations. Observations are, of course, important to validate and to ground things, but we can create model emulations and simulations of how the atmosphere behaves and go back much farther in time. Uh, in, in fact, we can replicate many, many iterations of the atmosphere over the historical period. In fact, my colleagues and I have done this many times in studies. We don't just simulate the 20th century once, we simulated dozens of times to get a better estimate of what the range of outcomes could have been during that period. In this way, we can get a lot more El Ninos or strong El Ninos, for example, in that model sample than exists in the real world. There have been maybe five, six, seven strong El Nino events this century, depending on how you measure it. But if you run about a century of, of, of years and then run them you know, with a model with 20, 30, 40 members, then you all of a sudden you get 100 years times 40 members. Uh, you have like 4,000 years, model years, to draw upon instead of just uh, 100 years, for example, uh, initially. So what that means is you're, you're going to get does, many dozens of El Nino events, a much larger sample size. Now, is it perfect? No, because obviously this is living in the model world, which is necessarily different than the real world. Uh, 
But it does mean though that we can radically increase the sample size, the synthetic sample size that way. And that's why when some folks say, oh, we have such a minimal sample to understand El Nino and California hydroclimate precipitation, we can't possibly say anything statistically significant. Well, I say, yeah, but we don't just have observations though. We have A, the theoretical studies going back to the 1980s and 1990s, which really, really powerfully suggest that strong El Nino events do fundamentally alter the circulation over the North Pacific Ocean for well understood dynamical reasons. You know, this essentially, unless something else comes along to disrupt that, that has to happen. It's a necessary outcome of the atmospheric adjustment to the tropical perturbation. Now, other things can and do come along and disrupt it, but all else equal, El Nino will have that effect unless something else comes and disrupts it, which it sometimes does. But the default is that El Nino is really this well understood physical uh, driver in the ocean atmosphere system. Uh, and the other piece of it is that we also have this large ensemble of climate model simulations to draw upon, which again, agree with theory. Again, the theory didn't have anything to do with, with climate models. This had to do with, with essentially first principles physics. The climate models agree that yes, El Nino does in fact have this really strong response and it's not a hundred percent correlation. You know, there's a, there's, it never offers more than a tilt on the odds. But when you replicate strong El Nino events dozens and dozens or even hundreds of times in the climate model world, which we can't do with real world observations, we just don't have that many, we see that this relationship stands out time and time and time again. So anyway, just a bit of a digression there once again, but I think these are interesting topics to digress on. So hopefully folks have found that helpful. All right. Um, a question from Mark. Uh, I gave brief tip, uh, hat tip, the potential of AI, artificial intelligence, um, in I guess in the weather weather predictive space. Could you explain what has moved off your previous position of skepticism? You know, first of all, I, I do want to have a session, a full dedicated conversation on this coming up. I was actually hoping to do it this week, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm just kind of overwhelmed by everything else I got to do right now. So apologies. That will happen at some point, maybe in December or possibly in January. But that will be imminently coming up some week where there isn't a uh, really dramatic weather event happening otherwise in California. So stay tuned for that. There may even be a special guest or two. Um, but generally speaking, you know, scientists are, are quite skeptical people by nature, it's literally the job is to be skeptical, not skeptical in the colloquial sense, but skeptical in the, in the very literal sense of requiring evidence. And up to the present, until very recently, there really hadn't been any convincing high quality evidence that fully artificial intelligence or machine learning derived models were either equivalent to or better than the existing decidedly clunky, but well-validated process-based models. That is starting to change. Some of these big tech companies, Google and Microsoft and others are publishing their data and publishing these, these flashy papers. I still think that some claims are overblown uh, and that, the, that a lot of these entities are not using the relevant evaluation metrics that I think would be appropriate for really being convincing. For example, a lot of these studies exclude precipitation because the machine learning models can't get precipitation right. It's kind of a big problem, uh, I would say. Uh, but just as an example, or they can't get extreme events right because they sort of give you a kind of a fuzzy picture. So the skill scores are high because if you squint enough, it looks an awful lot like the real world. But if you zoom in, these features are kind of unphysical and don't actually resemble the kinds of individual extreme events that we would expect to see in the real world. So that's a problem. That's an ongoing problem, even as these models rapidly accelerate. And who knows, with the pace of scientific publishing, it's possible, and the rate of, of machine learning, which, you know, which can literally be, in some cases, exponential, maybe this problem is already solved and I just don't know it yet. But I haven't seen a really convincing presentation of that evidence yet. So uh, we can talk about that more later. Uh, but I'll, that's just, hopefully that suffices for now. I will say that the field is advancing rapidly. I think that the most promising piece of this uh, might be for large ensemble modeling, at least initially, although there's an interesting study that just came out suggesting that AI-based weather models do not represent the butterfly effect. That kind of blew my mind, and that's kind of a problem because it means that they may be getting the right answers by the wrong means, 
that won't generalize towards longer-term prediction or out-of-sample prediction under conditions that we haven't seen before. So again, this is all, I know folks will quibble, and I'm sure if there are AI folks in the audience who've worked on these projects, they may already have responses to this, but these are the kinds of criticisms and the skepticisms that I, that I would want to levy in the context of something that everyone wants to work. I mean, it's not like weather scientists don't want it. I mean, I want it to be trivially easy to make great weather forecasts and climate projections. Doesn't everybody? But I think we need to be cautious that we're actually not just reinventing a wheel that works roughly as well as the wheel that we already have and then calling it something better. I do think that we can get there. We probably will get there eventually. I'm not totally convinced we're there yet though. And I think that the, the physical models and the AI based models are going to continue to evolve uh, in parallel for quite some time to come. So anyway, if you're at Google DeepMind, uh, hit me up and we can talk. All right, another sip of green tea. All right, there was a ditto of Mark's question, so I'm glad I, I went into that a bit. Let's see. There's a question about how the stratospheric warming, uh, how the stratosphere affects the jet stream, which affects El Nino. That is a topic I think for another day, partly because I'm not a stratosphere expert. There are literally atmospheric scientists who specialize in particular levels of the atmosphere and the stratosphere is, I guess I could say above my pay grade. Um, that's a bad uh, dad style joke for you. Uh, but it does affect the lower atmosphere, the troposphere. The stratosphere is not where weather happens for the most part, but it can affect the troposphere, which is the lowest layer of the atmosphere, which is where the weather happens uh, when there are events like, like stratospheric warming or cooling events. And honestly, we still don't fully understand the relationships between the stratosphere and the lower atmosphere. It's not well understood. There's a lot of complexity there. It's an active area of research, and I, even if we knew that there was going to be a sudden stratospheric warming event, say, in two weeks, I don't really have any way of translating that directly to what it would do for California weather. It often throws a wrench in things. That's the, probably the most strong thing that we can say is, if it happens, usually it results in different outcomes than had been previously predicted before that sudden stratospheric warming was uh, on the horizon. But exactly how it does so the sign, S-I-G-N, of the change can be in either direction, warmer or cooler, wetter or drier in a given place. It really just depends on the base state and the context. So the answer is it's complicated, it matters, and I can't really give you the specifics either in this case or even generally because I don't think it's just well understood enough yet. But it just goes to show you how much predictability there might be in the Earth system that we could leverage if we had models that could capture all of these things correctly. And that is where maybe AI could be really helpful because these are some really weak points. One of the challenges, by the way, of AI weather models is that the benchmark that they have to eclipse to be viewed as being useful is really high. We have very good weather models right now that are processed and physics-based. So in order for AI and machine learning-based models to be taken seriously, they have to exceed what is arguably a very high bar. When it comes to seasonal prediction though, or the stratosphere or things like that, we do not have very good predictions, and so the bar is much lower. And ironically, I'm a little bit more optimistic in, in some ways in the short run potential for AI to help us out there. Because here, it's essentially such a low bar that any improvement would be notable and helpful. And that is where it might help us uncover some patterns that we have missed as humans, because we don't have adequate process-based models representing those processes. And that is where the, the, the sort of the, the multi-dimensionality and the extreme efficiency of asking questions that comes about using uh, machine learning uh, as, a, as a tool might really uh, manifest itself. So how's that for a more optimistic take on where, where we could see some rapid advances if we target it uh, in that direction? All right. No, as a question from Charlie, uh, would you please explain the SO part of the ENSO? Okay, so literally the last two letters of the acronym in terms of big hemispheric or ocean wide scale. Uh, really, the Southern SO is, means, stands for Southern Oscillation 
technically the full acronym is actually supposed to have a slash, El Nino slash Southern Oscillation. Uh, Southern Oscillation is essentially just a reference to one of the atmospheric dynamical adjustments that occurs during an El Nino or a La Nina event. Essentially, there is a certain amount of mass in the atmosphere. So the air weighs a certain amount, and there's this year there's neither more air than there or less air than there was last year. So the amount of mass in the atmosphere is essentially conserved. There's a little bit of things, there's a, there, there's a little bit uh, of, of difference. Uh, some years, in fact, some very hot years have more moisture in the atmosphere because a warmer uh, atmosphere holds more water vapor. So that can change the overall mass of the atmosphere, but we're talking about really small fractions of percent variability from year to year. For all intents and purposes, the, the atmospheric mass is the same from year to year. But what are high and low pressure systems? Well, if you think about it, if the, if the total mass of the atmosphere is constant over time, high and low pressure systems just represent the redistribution of that mass in space and time. So if you're under a high pressure system, it means that there is a literally a heavier column of air above your head in that moment than there is in an adjacent area that's experiencing low pressure. It is a zero sum game in terms of the atmospheric mass. If it's high pressure in one spot, you gotta have low pressure somewhere else uh, or, or else you're, uh, you're violating that mass conservation. All of that is to say, Southern Oscillation responds to the atmospheric dynamical adjustment, the shift of that atmospheric mass, the change in high and low pressure patterns that occurs in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so the, the Southern Oscillation Index, the SOI for example, is measured as a simple barometric pressure difference between Tahiti and Darwin, Australia. And some of this just happens to be a, a sort of a historical curiosity that stems from geographically where were the scientists who made some of these initial discoveries about the oscillation. As it turns out, the, the Southern Oscillation Index is a reasonably good indicator of El Nino or La Nina strength, just this simple pressure difference between Tahiti and Darwin. And so the Southern Oscillation essentially just refers to this redistribution of mass that occurs in the atmosphere during El Nino and La Nina events. So it's just kind of a neat way of packaging a bunch of stuff into the same acronym, uh, talking about how the atmosphere actually responds to the tropical ocean warming. Interesting question. All right. Uh, question from uh, Land of Little Rain. What paleoclimate regime is likely the best model for what California climate will look like in 100 years? One of the challenges is that we don't know, except that we probably don't have any analog from, or really good analog for, for paleoclimate. We certainly have epochs in the past, right, where the Earth's climate was much warmer than it was during the 20th century. So it's not like it's never, you know, it's not like the Earth has never been as warm as, as, as it will be in a few decades from now. It certainly hasn't been that warm in human history, but in geologic history, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, geologic history, we've had palm trees and, and crocodiles in the Arctic, uh, and we've also had ice sheets that extended almost down to the equator uh, at other points in Earth's history. So pretty much any conceivable climate conditions has, has occurred at some point before. Doesn't mean it would be good for humans though, and, but the difference is the rate of change is just astonishingly fast compared to anything we really see uh, in, the, in the recent geologic record. So in like the past thousands of years, we just don't have any analog for how, how quickly conditions are changing. And perhaps really even within hundreds of thousands of years in many ways, we just don't have an analog for how rapid the warming we're, we're experiencing now and will probably experience for decades to come is likely to be. And to be clear, I am not a paleoclimatologist. I do have colleagues who are, but my understanding is that the combination of uh, part of, well, let me back up a moment. One of the problems, one of the reasons why we might not have a good analog for this climate is we're experiencing very rapid warming. There has been very rapid warming in the past, well before humans though, and so long ago that the continents and the ice sheets were in different places than they are now. So if you go back just a few hundred years or a few thousand years, the continents haven't really changed very much, not noticeably. It's more or less the same. You go back hundreds of thousands or millions of years though, or hundreds of millions of years even, 
and the earth it just has a completely different configuration the, the land and the ocean are in different places the oceans are different sizes there's different balances of land masses in the northern versus the southern hemisphere there's more land mass either in polar regions versus equatorial regions all of this means that i don't think we really do have a great analog paleoclimate wise for where we're headed necessarily and paleoclimatologists may have their own favorite epoch that they think will be most similar but the consensus that i have really ascertained from my colleagues in that respect is that there isn't a good analog because we've probably never experienced this rate of warming with this particular configuration of continents, this particular initial base state of where the ice sheets are and how extensive they are, and this, this, this particular placement within essentially Milankovitch cycles, so these, these orbital patterns of the Earth versus the Sun that also help dictate changes in climate over hundreds of thousands or millions of years, we may be experiencing essentially a unique combination of very rapid warming with the continents where they are now, with the Earth's orbit doing what it is today. Um, so yes, there are some points uh, from the Holocene that we can maybe point to as, as, as partial analogs, um, but uh, it is a brave new world in a lot of ways. And our best tool for understanding that are climate model predictions of the future, but they are imperfect tools and paleoclimate can help us fill in the gaps, but that too is going to be an imperfect tool because there may not be any perfect analogs. Some very interesting tangents today stemming from some good questions. A question from Marie about the geomagnetic storm or, uh, that's or the from stemming from the coronal mass ejection that's coming in today. There is such a thing as space weather, and I am not an expert in that whatsoever. If there's ever a Carrington-level uh, geomagnetic storm coming in, I'll try and quickly spin up on it and have a session before we all lose internet for a couple of years. Uh, but uh, this does not look anything like that, and beyond that, unless you're at pretty high latitudes, you might see some pretty auroras uh, if you use uh, high-frequency uh, radios to communicate with people, especially in the Arctic, you might have uh, a lot of static. Other than that, I'm not sure how remarkable this will be. But again, I'm not an expert there and hopefully never have to become a public communication expert in that because uh, that's a whole nother can of worms. I am not a space weather scientist. That is for sure. One thing I will say, and this is a response to a question from Kit about the ridging in the North Pacific and drought, it's very unlikely that California is going to enter a new drought this year. And that's partly because of the prediction, again, quite a strong tilt in the odds towards better than average conditions in Southern California this year in particular, and also Central California. But also, it's just the antecedent conditions. Last year was so wet in most of California, and even the summer in Southern California was also like genuinely wet, like the wettest summer on record in most places, from, thanks to Tropical Storm Hillary. Uh, we're not in a drought in most parts of California by most definitions at the moment. Certainly not a soil moisture drought. Uh, so uh, we would need exceptionally dry conditions this year or exceptionally hot conditions this year to fall into a drought. It's possible the next summer is really, really hot. That is a distinct possibility. But the likelihood that this winter will be very dry is very low. It might not be exceptionally wet, and you know this is this is where the tilt and the odds comes in. The whole distribution tilts towards wetter than average, so it it doesn't completely eliminate the possibility of a really dry winter, but it makes it a lot less likely. Uh, as those uh, as that whole uh, bell ish, it's not really a bell curve, but for purposes of visualization, let's just uh, uh, imagine that that bell curve is shifting up the x axis towards wetter conditions, making the really wet conditions more likely and the really dry conditions less likely, but not completely ruling out either outcome. That's kind of how I view it. But because we're not going into this winter with exceptionally dry conditions, in fact, and we're also going into this winter with actually unusually wet conditions in many areas, at least in terms of the antecedents in the, in the weeks and seasons past. And we're also heading into a winter where the odds favor wetter than average conditions. I'm not super concerned about California heading into a major drought this year. What happens two years from now? That's a completely different story. 
Uh, but at least for this year, meaning at this point, 2024, I don't think it's likely that California will be experiencing a drought of any significant severity, at least through next summer. The following winter, we'll see what happens. Uh, and again, that doesn't necessarily mean that next summer will be as mild wildfire-wise, by the way, as this year was, because it could be quite a wet winter, but if things really dry out and heat up next summer and autumn, it could be off to the races again. But it does say I don't think we're going to be experiencing severe or extreme drought conditions over the next year. And that is partly a prediction about the future. It's also partly just an observation about the recent past. Yeah, there's a question uh, from Patrick Gallagher about uh, this coming summer. Would you uh, be able to do some short videos uh, on fire weather uh, conditions? That would be a great resource for us uh, in the fire service. When there are major events or potential major events, I will I, I, I will probably be doing some um, shorter fused or shorter notice sessions. I don't think it's a service I can offer on a regular basis. I'm at this point, I'm trying to figure out what to cut so I can get back down to 80 hours a week. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but uh, I think that when there are significant events on the horizon, I will try and do those. Um, you may have, I, I did a couple of these this year for other kinds of other events. So you might have seen the middle of the night radar tour uh, when Tropical Storm Hillary was making landfall. And a couple of uh, radar and satellite kind of tours talking about the short-term evolution of the pattern last winter during the uh, atmospheric river onslaught with all the flooding and the and the wind damage and all, all, all the crazy stuff that happened last winter. Um, there hasn't really been a fire weather scenario of really widespread extreme intensity since I have started doing these YouTube sessions uh, late last year. So this is really, I've really only been doing these for about a year. And we have not had widespread adverse fire weather conditions really in California since that time. So that eventually that will change and you'll definitely see me do some sessions then. In terms of more structured, more regular ones, we'll just have to see sort of how this happens uh, over over the next couple of years. To be quite honest, I'm still struggling to find institutional funding to continue my role as it is now, despite all of the attention it's gotten over the past couple months. Uh, I'm still, still, still not there yet. Um, some leads, but I'm still working on it. So uh, anyway, that's a little bit of a different point, uh, but just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, let's see, uh, we're, we're actually past the hour, so these are bonus minutes, but let me just see what else we've got going here in terms of questions. Um, howdy to everybody who said hello. It's always nice to see folks cross over uh, on platforms. Yes, let's see. Yeah, all right. Well, it looks like I, I've, I've covered most of the substantive questions this session. Uh, you know, I do have to keep it to an hour. I could literally talk forever. Um, this is why I've learned to have a little bit of green tea uh, in a cup beside me, since otherwise I will literally just talk till I lose my voice. Um, that has happened on a lot of these sessions. Uh, but with that, I think I've covered uh, most of what I wanted to chat about today. Again, just a reminder, the, the links uh, up in the beginning of the comment section, the first one is a way you can subscribe to an ad-free version of Weather West, um, where you get absolutely no new content except you don't see ads if you log in, a way to support the site. And then also, secondarily, a link to the NOAA blog post talking about El Nino, ENSO, uh, and the all of the kinds of ensemble modeling and seasonal predictive challenges that I've mentioned. I think it's a great post. I'm really glad that NOAA is supporting that kind of public facing communication. It's, it's, it's delightfully informal for a federal agency and yet the quality and accessibility is extremely high. So I wish we would see more stuff like that, but it seems to be an uphill battle in some circles. Fortunately, somebody convinced the folks at NOAA Climate that this was a good idea and I'm glad they did. All right, uh, thanks everybody, and I will talk, I'll see you all next time.